Ben Gagney with the Indie Cider Show, and before we get to this week's game, I want to let you know why it may seem like we haven't had one of these episodes in a while. It's because you missed the audio-only show we did on New Year's Eve. There were so many great indie games released in 2014 that we devoted an entire show just to them, and I invited three special guests onto the show to talk about their picks for 2014. I had Mr. Matt Kahn, founder of Gamer X, now known as GX. I had Sabriel Mastin of Indie Haven and Indie Gamer Chick. And I had Emma Clarkson of the Boston Festival of Indie Games. If you want to hear that hour-plus-long show where we talk about our favorite games from 2014, click the links in the show notes for this video to find it in iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, or on my website at IndieCider.net. Now, let's get to this week's game. So here we are with IndieCider episode number 15, featuring Never Alone for the PlayStation 4. This game is also known as Kasima Inichuna. This game is a collaboration with the Inupiaq culture of Alaska. Eline Media, who's lead game designer, Grant Roberts, I'll be speaking to later in this episode, worked with Upper One Games to adapt the cultural heritage and oral traditions of the Inupiaq people into a PlayStation 4 game, which is pretty darn cool. So I'm going to show you not the first chapter, because the first two levels aren't the most exciting to watch necessarily. So I'm going to start with uh, the young Inupiaq girl, Nuna, getting back to her village. Slight spoiler alert. So slightly dark in spots, perhaps not appropriate for children, but that is one of the art styles seen in this game. This is not what the gameplay itself actually looks like. That looks a little bit more like this. Here we go. So I am playing as Nuna, and there's an arctic fox following me. And the fox is controlled by the AI. But if I push the triangle button, I can then play as the fox. And each has unique strengths that you'll see throughout this video. Or if you go to the options, you can actually switch from single player to co-op which is a lot of fun, in my opinion. That's the way the game should be played. So it's mostly a traditional 2D side-scrolling puzzle platformer. We have to figure out how to get from one area to the next. Not Metroidvania style, but uh, it's mostly left to right with some up and down. So this is where the fox comes into play. At certain points, the fox... If it is near the spirits, the spirits will appear. So, for example, if I were to play as the fox and just walk away, the ghost will probably disappear. Or I found that out in two-player mode anyway, perhaps not so much in one-player mode. So here I can stand on the ghost's, or the spirit rather, the spirit's beak, and make it up that cliff that I otherwise would not be able to ascend, because it would be too tall. Now, if I were to fall into that pit, I would die. Sometimes there's a stiff wind that can blow me into pits, in which case I push the circle button and I brace against the wind like that. Because, right, if I weren't bracing, that wind would push me around. But sometimes it can push me around in the direction I want to go. So in this case, I wait for it to blow right, and then I jump farther than I normally would be able to. And I can make it past that obstacle. So a little bit of timing involved there. Also, in case you miss it, there were some, I think, ghosts running around in the foreground. These are 3D sprites, but a 2D game for the most part. I so now I'm going to switch to the fox because he can climb up on these ledges. Whoop, get up there. Maybe not. He can also do some uh, wall jumps like that. Whoops. Yeah, there we go. And see, just by being on this spirit, it comes closer so Nuna can climb aboard. And now I think I, there we go. Because I just showed the spear the direction I wanted to go in. So. 
And now somebody is calling to me, the Owl Man. This is the point in the game when I think it gets a little bit more interesting, and it's pretty early on too, so you haven't missed much. The first two levels are pretty much just getting your bearings, learning the commands, getting introduced to the fox. It's not her pet, it's a wild fox that just showed up. So at this point, the game gets a little bit more interesting because you actually have a goal, something to do as opposed to just somewhere to be. Uh, it becomes a fetch quest at this point, and you get to see some of the different skills that characters have. For example, I can't jump up there, but if I switch to the fox, then he can wall climb. And then once up here, he can lower the rope, switch back to Nuna, and then she climbs up. Now, sometimes the game doesn't move at quite the right speed. Like here, you need to go down into that pit, but if I just jump down there too fast, the game can actually end right there. I could have died. Uh, fortunately, it scrolled quickly enough this time. But here, I just need to push this over here. Slowly we turn, step by step, inch by inch, until finally it's all the way over. Great. Uh, I still need to use the fox, though. The arctic fox climbs up there, lowers the rope, and now Nuna switches back over. And depending on how well your TV shows off the different levels of black in this game, this level can be a little bit hard to see. I will not skip that at this point. Uh, giant boulder, Indiana Jones style, that little underground child is going to roll it at me and destroy all the platforms, which they probably built, so they're really just destroying their own work, which isn't really in their own best interest. Uh, but I can make it this far. But now I'm stuck. This child up there, though, is going to throw boulders at me, so I want to not get hit by them. But I do want to pile them up on the left side, thus raising this part. How many do I need? Two or three, I forget. Whoops. Let's get him to throw one more, just in case. I forget how many. Whoa. No, I think two is it then. Yep, and it runs away as soon as I get here. And I get the drum. So now I have the Owlman's drum. I'm just hanging off my back right there. And now I can just go back this way. Push this again. Or not again, it's a different one now. Once I get the drum back to the Owl Man, the game gets even more interesting because then you gain some offensive capabilities, which is fun. And wall jump. Nope, maybe not. There we go. Oh. Okay, that was mildly frustrating. My apologies for the delay. One more important thing about this game is that at any point you can pause the game and go to Cultural Insights, which you actually unlock as you play the game. And these are a variety of interviews, basically, or mini documentaries about different aspects of the Inupiaq culture. Let me show you one about Scrimshaw. I believe I've unlocked that one. Here it is. So Scrimshaw is this really beautiful method of art that's done either on baleen or ivory, and traditionally it was used to tell stories. Each etching is telling a story of some event. Uh, caribou hunting was taking place, this is what was going on. War began around this time, and so it sort of gives you a timeline of history through etching. An elder or the person who carved it would literally be able to read the Scrimshaw story. They're like reading a book, in a way. A lot of so there are a variety of interviews on the, these various subjects. They do not have to be viewed to progress in the game. They are unlocked through the game, but they don't integrate with the game. It's not part of the cutscenes or whatever. You're not required to watch them. At any point, they're available to you so you can piecemeal them out per level and watch them, or just sit back and watch all of them once you're done with the game. And once you get up there, the game warps back to the overworld, returns the drum. He was so happy. 
and so proud. So now I get the bola. It is a weapon that I can spin around and throw at things such as marauders, bears, ice walls, icicles. And at this point, I'm going to end the Let's Play of the game and introduce Mr. Grant Roberts, the lead game designer. And you can listen to our interview while I continue to play the game. Today, I'm chatting with Grant Roberts, lead game designer at Eline Media. Hello, Grant. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for being had. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. So Never Alone came out about a month or two ago. What have you been up to since then? Keeping busy? <laughs> yes, definitely keeping busy. Uh... In, in this day and age, in, in 2014 and getting near 2015, uh, the days of, of launching a game and having that be the end of it are kind of are pretty much over. Uh, this project and the last few I've worked on, uh, launch day is kind of just the beginning. Uh, in previous previous projects, we we've made additional content for games, but uh, for Never Alone, we 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 had a bunch of things that we wanted to to fix uh, to, to to include in patches to make sure that the that the game. Ex Experience was even better. So we've been working on patches pretty much nonstop since since we shipped. Uh, we put out a few on PC and uh, and uh, one or two on consoles as well. So yeah, that's still still no rest for uh, for us yet. But it's uh, it's certainly not as as crazy as it was in the days leading up to launch. Now those patches are those to address game breaking bugs, or is it more refinements? Definitely more refinements. Uh, we the only game breaking bug that we've run into is a uh, it's a very specific hardware issue on PC with um, with some kind of, some specific combination of uh, of GPUs and, and laptops. But we're still trying to track that one down. We've got a few workarounds for it, but nothing nothing you know too serious as far as bugs go. It's more more refinements and polish and improvement stuff that we just we just ran out of time to fix before the game came out sadly. Great. So you have spoken at length about this game at neveralonegame.com and also with Katrina Filipidis at indiegamemag.com. I'd like to go a little bit more in depth about some of those topics. One question I have is you've obviously worked very closely with the Inupiaq community to create this game and to convey their culture. Who would you say is your core audience for this game? Certainly they want to relay this culture, this heritage to their own next generation, but would you say that's your target audience, or is it more about making outside cultures aware of this culture they may not be previously familiar with? Well, our main target audience uh, for this game is, <laughs> I, I am a, a frequent member of this audience, it's kind of a the audience for puzzle platformers, and uh, Never Alone is kind of an atmospheric puzzle platformer, and uh, the audience for games like that is is pretty significant, I think, as as games like you know Brothers and Limbo and Braid and Fez and Journey have shown over the years. So that's kind of our core audience is, is people who like those kind of games. But as we've been developing it, we found that you know it's it's also very popular with with families who want to play uh, with each other or. Uh, you know, people who just who have never played a game before, people who are who are usually into different genres, and so it's it's definitely not just for the Anupia community. It's definitely not just for indie gamers. I've I've had a lot of friends and family even approach me and say, you know, this is the first time they've played a game in a long time. Uh, so our target audience has expanded a lot from uh, from that that kind of the the indie puzzle platformer uh, target that we initially were shooting for. And what is it about this game that is creating that broad appeal you're experiencing, where people who don't usually play this kind of game are playing this one? Well, I think people are definitely drawn to the to the story of the game's development. You know, it's pretty unique that uh, a game development studio, uh, you know, Upper One Games is the first indigenous-owned uh, game studio in the U.S., and they they were our partner. They were Eline Media's partners and all this. But it's it's also rare for a, a game development studio to collaborate so closely with with any community in general, let alone the the so many members of the Alaska Native community. So that's what you know people people would read that kind of thing on in articles about the game or they'd hear about it on Facebook posts or stuff like that and they'd be drawn to it just because it was it was so unique of a story and so you know different of a of a culture that hasn't really been explored that much before you know the game itself is you know we it's 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 offers local co-op which is something that a lot of puzzle platformers don't do and the setting is kind of different but it, at its core it's you know it's it's the puzzle platformer is a pretty fam uh, pretty familiar genre so i think people were were really drawn to to the story behind the game's development 
Now, this game is based on a particular story from that culture. I believe it's called Kanuksayuka. Is that correct? Yeah, that, no, that's exactly correct. Kanuksayuka is, uh, or it's, I'm, I'm, it's, it's probably pronounced even better than that. But yeah, it is, it is uh, based on, on that story. At the beginning of the project, we worked really closely with uh, Ishmael Hope, uh, who is uh, half Inupiaq, half Tlingit who really kind of, he's a storyteller uh, by, by profession, and he really helped us get immersed in just hundreds of, of stories of the Inupiaq people, and Kanuksiyuko was one of the ones that uh, lent itself the best to a video game structure, as, uh, uh, as one of the cultural insight videos says in the game. Um, and so we, once we decided that we wanted to use that story, we, we sought permission from... Um, the, the story was first told in written form by, or first written down by, uh, by, from the tellings of Robert Cleveland or Nasrook. And we sought permission from his uh, daughter, Minnie Gray, uh, to, to use the story in our game. And we got that permission because we, you know, we didn't want, we wanted to do things right. You know, we wanted to, to collaborate with the Inupia the right way. We didn't want to do anything thing halfway so we wanted to make sure that we got permission before we use the story in our game and and for our game so it was cleveland's particular adaptation that you were working with because i was wondering if it was just an oral tradition why would you have to license it as far as i know you can't copyright (laughs) an oral tradition yeah i mean it was it it's definitely his interpretation of it and along the way we, we talked with uh ronald brower one of the elders that we that we consulted and collaborated with through the game he actually we asked him about the story of kanuksuyoka and it was a similar structure but his the one that he had heard had many different elements as a part of it the structure was generally the same which is kind of similar to how the structure of never alone is similar to the structure of uh Kanuksiyoka, but his ending was very different from ours and there were a lot of other things that happened along the way so uh yeah it was it was that very specific version that we uh that we licensed for for use in the game now when you were exploring different stories to adapt and you were working with the community were there any boundaries they set up about you know we want you to focus on this or not that or were there uh certain topics that they were not willing to discuss no, not really. I mean, it was a, it was, like I said, it was a pretty close collaboration. Like there, all the topics that we wanted to explore in the game were, were topics that, uh, members of the Alaska uh, native community, uh, deal with every day or that, that are very strong or very special to them or very important to them. You know, we, uh, like there are 24 inside videos in the game and I, I don't remember all of them from memory off the top of my head, but they're all, they're all very relevant in, in, uh, in day-to-day life for the most part. And so there weren't really any, any things that were off limits or anything that, that they, that they, you know, steered us away from or, or, or things like that. It was more of a, you know, as we were making the game and exploring the concepts that kind of related to the game, it was figuring out how we, we could find ways to tell stories about these concepts in Never Alone and also find ways of exploring the more traditional values of the Inupiaq people, which, as represented in the game, are resilience, intergenerational exchange, and interdependence. And those three in particular, you know, come out with the gameplay and with the, kind of the overall experience of playing the game. Uh, but those were just as important to us to to get across as, you know, the more explicit topics that you would see in the cultural insight videos. Now, one of the things that I learned in a previous episode of my other podcast, Polygamer, is that when you are adapting elements from another culture, it's important to be respectful of the original context and how those artifacts are used. Certainly, you've done that, and you had a community of elders to guide you in that process. But given Never Alone's success, have you had any concern about other publishers or other developers appropriating these elements? Because they've seen how popular it is in your game, and they want to use it and perhaps misuse it in their own. Well, I, I think there's always there's always the opportunity for that, and I think you you know without without calling out any specific titles, you know the the representation of of indigenous people and native culture, and specifically Native American culture, does not exactly have the best track record in the games industry. So I think it would be very easy for somebody to to look at what we did in this game and not follow the same inclusive development process that we did with the community, and like you say, just kind of treat it as a grab bag for influences. And I don't think that people would respond as well for it. Like, you know, people are welcome to do it whatever they want. And it's it's absolutely true that the Alaska Native community, the Nubiac community, Tlinga, all these other these other tribes up there have just thousands of years of stories that are that are that are rich with history and and uh, 
and intrigue and you know uh, excitement that can be used as inspiration for games but if they're just used as inspiration then it's not it's not quite as special it what people won't connect with it as well so um i'm I'm not too worried about that i i if anything i think it would be good because it would encourage people to explore this setting that hasn't been explored that much you know we've we've all seen a lot of a lot of military shooters a lot of uh you know fantasy straight up fantasy high fantasy environments so anything that encourages you know new new settings and and new ideas would, would be okay with me now the reason that your game is so respectful of that culture is because you had that collaboration with Upper One Games. Can you tell me a little bit more about what their contribution was? Did they do any of the actual software development, for example? Well, Upper One Games, uh, a few months ago, Upper One Games actually merged with Eli Media, and uh, while they were they were kind of the the uh, the publisher of the game, and that they, that Upper One Games was the for profit uh, game studio that was formed by the Cook Inlet Tribal Council, and uh, they were who we collaborated the most with while we were making the game, in addition to, uh, you know, storytellers and elders and other members of the community. But they, you know, Upper One Upper One Games and Eli Media, like I said, are, are kind of the, the same entity now. So most of the development happened in actual Seattle, Washington, where Eli, one of the Eli Studios is headquartered. Upper One Games is based in Alaska, and we would take trips uh, up to them to, to meet with them and and make sure that we are on the same page with stuff for milestones and, you know, very frequently collaborate with them. And they would come down, uh, you know, to check in with us and, and, and kind of sit in on meetings and, and make sure that we were all on the same page and going in the right direction. Now, a lot of the material that you're able to include in this game comes in the form of the cultural insights, sort of documentary segments. What other methods did you consider for presenting that information, such as integrating them into gameplay or as cutscenes, as opposed to having a separate menu item for them? There is a version of this game that could have been made that had the topics that were covered in the cultural insights, you know, presented more of it. In an, in an in-game fashion where like you know characters you would meet would tell you about these things but it would have been very easy for that to end up really you know dry and educational or like you know kind of like breaking the fourth wall a little bit and just as importantly for us you know we had these things that we wanted to explore the values of the Inupiaq people and you know telling some of these these characters and 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 other elements of these stories but it was just as important for us to show the faces behind the community to show the faces behind the voices that we were collaborating with that we were learning from uh the people whose culture that we were wanting to showcase that we we wanted to help bring to the world and to a modern audience so while the you know, it's kind of a strange thing for a, a video clip to, to be a collectible in a game. I think that it works really well because it, it helps ground this kind of fantastic experience, fantastic in the, in the fantasy sense. Um, not, not we're totally fantastic, by the way. Um, this experience that you're having in the game with the with real people, with people like Ishmael and Ron and Amy and James Nagayak and, and his wife Anna and all these people that we that we worked with, storytellers and elders and other community members. So yeah, we could have gone in a different direction with it if we if we're lucky enough to make more world games in the future with with more stories with Noon and Fox with other cultures, we might more explore different ways of of doing that. Um, I think that that Never Alone and other games like Val uh, Valiant Hearts have shown that people want this kind of thing. They want more context for what they're playing if it's available. So I think that'll always have a place. Now that culture comes across not just in the insights and the videos, but also of course in the actual game and the gameplay itself. How did you choose 2D platformer or a puzzle platformer as the genre in which to do that, as opposed to say a 3D game like Papo and Yo or a top-down game like Spirits of Spring or even a more traditionally narrative-driven genre like an RPG? Mm. Oh man, now I, now I really want to make a Never Alone RPG. Thanks for uh, thanks for lighting that fire in my brain. Oh, that one's free. Help yourself. <laughs> we'll credit you, don't worry. It was important for us to, like I said, you know, the target audience for the game was people who are fans of puzzle platformers. That was after we kind of figured out that that's what we wanted to make. But early on, we kind of knew that we wanted it to be not just experienced by that kind of narrow focus or that kind of target audience. And, you know, the platformer, as you know, has been around for pretty much almost as long as the video game industry itself. So it's a pretty easy uh, game genre to just pick up and press buttons and start playing. So that was a nice bonus for us. And along the way, the puzzle platformers rise in the last few years, the last decade or however long you want to chart it. 
has really augmented that genre in an interesting way. Like, you know, having the player do something besides just move from left to right for an entire stage or figure out how to move from left to right um, is something that's really compelling to me personally. And I think the success of our peers or our, at least our inspirations uh, has shown that people like that kind of genre. So um, once we figured that out, there were a lot of also really great side benefits with, you know, we could get the camera a lot closer in, in on characters in, the, in, a, in a platformer to really uh, show off the animations, to, to really bring these characters to life and really emphasize the relationship between Noon and Fox that they had and things like that. So um, the puzzle platformer and the indie platformer, I guess, in general is kind of, it, you know, it's, a, it's certainly a saturated genre, um, but there's a reason why I think so many... Uh, critical darlings in the last few years have have been in that genre because it offers you a pretty a pretty great canvas to work from. Now, in terms of gameplay, this genre is puzzle platformer, and you can look to Limbo or Braid as precedents. But in terms of theme, this game never alone could be called a world game. What other games would you consider world games that you look to for inspiration? There are not too many. I mean, uh, I you know we have said before that that Eli Media and Upper One Games and CITC are really pioneering this genre of world games and we're kind of creating it. But that's not to say that there aren't other games that are out there that are that are trying to share cultures that are underrepresented or share even cultures that are already represented. I mean, I just mentioned Valiant Hearts, you know, the the culture of of Europe in 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 World War One is certainly one that hasn't been explored that much. Uh, you know, Papo and Yo is another one that you, they're they're bringing you to a world is I guess another uh, way to define a world game. It's really fully immersing you in them. So, um, what I what the one definition that I think world games would have to have though is that it's a real place, or at least the game is inspired by something that's 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 real um, and could you know you could go visit or has existed in history. So I think that's one. That's one thing that Valiant Hearts uh, and Never Alone share in that respect. And congratulations to Valiant Hearts, by the way, for winning uh, two video game awards, including one that we were nominated for. Darn you. We'll, we'll get them next time. Um, but they're, they're, they're definitely uh, carrying the torch for, for Ubisoft, and we're, we're really happy to see their success. So with so few world games out there, it's easy to be original but hard to find inspiration. I'm curious about how that plays into your own background. You've worked on such games as Dungeon Siege, Superhero Squad Online, <laughs> Shadow Slayer. What in your background prepared you to work on Never Alone, or what was most similar to what you're now working on? Huh. What was most similar? I that's a good question. Um, huh. I'm not. I don't know that it's it, it's it's difficult for me to even pick one thing on my uh in my list of shipped titles that is that that is similar to to never alone at all i mean it's it's a very you know it's telling a story in a, in a really in a really different way so it's so it's kind of similar to to the work i did on on wheel of time a long long time ago uh, which is not that much work um but like a really immersive world in the same way that uh that we tried to create with with dungeon siege and, you know, in some ways, it sounds very strange to say this, but, you know, we worked, as you mentioned, I worked on a Superhero Squad Online, which is a Marvel game uh, for all ages. And we worked with Marvel as they were the license holder and we were the license, the licensor and or the licensee. Wait a minute, am I getting that right? No, whatever. Uh, they were we didn't know what to expect when we first uh, started working with Marvel. Were they, were they going to be very difficult? Uh, were we going to have to, to, to sacrifice a lot of things in the game to, to make sure that it was an authentic Marvel experience? And, and the answer was no, they ended up being an amazing uh, company to work with. Uh, and it sounds strange to say it, but the Inupiaq community, the Alaska native community was kind of similar in that we, we licensed uh, you know their story to use in the game. We we did not know what to expect when we first when we first started working with them, uh, but it ended up being an incredibly smooth process, and and we worked very well together, and it ended up producing something uh, you know that was that turned out great, that was very successful. I think the main thing that prepared me for for making this game was just my interest in the genre and my interest in the in the culture of native people that you know I kind of had in a non-professional capacity for years. And I was finally able to, to apply it uh, while creating this game. 
And I think a lot of my hunger for, for new types of game experiences and new types of stories and new types of cultures in games is kind of what, what led me here and led a lot of people on the team uh, here kind of away from, because a lot of us have, you know, AAA backgrounds. You know, we worked on things like SOCOM and Rage and Tomb Raider and, and Mech Warrior and all these kind of really big budget uh, AAA things. But we were all kind of ready for something new, ready to take a break from AAA and do this more kind of small scope uh, and more intimate thing. Well, given Never Alone success, I think it's fair to say that it's charting a new course in your career and that we're probably going to be seeing more like this. Do you have any hopes to adapt stories from other cultures into future games? I certainly hope so. You know, uh, we've actually been approached by representatives from other cultures who have seen the inclusive development process that we've gone through with the Inupiaq people, with the Alaska Native community, and and been and, and approached us to, to to say, you know, we we love what you've we love what you've done with the with the Inupia community please can we can we work with you to to share our culture with the world to tell story to, to share our stories and we would absolutely love to do that you know we're I don't think we're done telling stories with Noon and Fox because we love Noon and Fox and they're great and we love uh, working with CITC and and other one games and and the Alaska Native community um but we we would be just as interested in, in making games based on other cultures around the world. So I'm really hoping that we can. Uh, part of that has to do with the with the success of Never Alone. Uh, but part of that is is due to just you know whatever comes next. And and we're hoping that this that more people will become interested in world games, and as a result, more cultures will will want to make world games either with us or, or by themselves or with other studios. It's a it's a great time to start. Well, given the success of Never Alone, I think that's a safe bet. I admire what you've done with this game and i think it's deserving of all the rewards it's getting including those it's the ones it's not getting <laughs> <laughs> well thank you i appreciate it. the whole development team appreciates that it's been really amazing to to see the critical reception you know there have been some reviews that are that are lower scored than others and but a lot of there have been hundreds of them now that when we read every one of them and it's really inspiring to see uh people who have been so uh, who have responded so so well to it it's, it's been really encouraging for us and for uh, all the community that we've worked with. Wonderful. Well, I'm glad to have had the opportunity to play the game and then to have spoken to one of its creators. So thank you so much for your time. Absolutely, Ken. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it.